I fear no man. But that... Anime season. It scares me. We all know COVID did a number on uh, everything this year, but more importantly, it did a number on the only thing that matters, anime. Due to the incredibly tight production schedules on which this industry operates, a lot of shows had to be delayed or split up this year, and even eternal weekly fixtures like Pokemon and One Piece faced rare pauses in their production. From Shonen Jump heavy hitters to huge light novel franchises, a lot of high-profile anime that were slated to return this year ended up being held back. And for the most part, the complications that caused those delays seem to have been sorted out. But the thing is, through some wild coincidence, despite these shows' initially staggered release schedules, literally all of them were sorted out just in time to come out next month. Except the one that came out this month. So despite the many sacrifices that most of us have made to avoid super-spreading at anime conventions this year, Winter 2021 might very well wipe out this entire community faster than the virus ever could. There are so many killer sequels dropping on top of a promising lineup of new titles that I don't know where I'll find time to watch it all, let alone eat and sleep, and this is my job. Our one saving grace might be the fact that everyone's jumped ship to VTubers lately, but with Attack on Titan already pulling Otaku back in, there's no guarantee that'll hold. Which only makes our surviving this thing more imperative, for if we die, who will be left to appease our new anime overlords with super chats? To avert catastrophe, I've put together this handy field guide, covering all the big returning anime that you're going to need to know about so you can figure out what's worth catching up on before the season fully starts and, uh, hopefully carve out at least a bit of time to enjoy the new anime recommendations I'll be dropping with the next ones to watch, too. Now, it is too late to catch up on Attack on Titan before it starts again, as the final season is already underway and already starting some hilarious squabbles in the review section of my anime list. Its current score is a touch high for a single episode, to be fair, but if you're not already following what's arguably the biggest anime in the world right now, you should at least take the passion behind that inflated score as a sign that it's worth considering, even if you fell off the series in past seasons. I can hardly blame you if you did. Attack on Titan has a bit of a slow start. For a long time, it just feels like an animated up version of a generic zombie movie. There was a long delay before it got its second wind, and while it's been steadily ramping up in quality and intensity since its return in 2017, 60 episodes is a lot to ask for even the best anime. But the thing is, Attack on Titan has gotten really good. The third season, particularly in its second part, did so much to expand the scope of the series' world beyond the walls that previously constrained it, raising its stakes and dramatically complicating its central conflict at the same time. The colossal Titan who kicked this whole story off has at last been conquered, but in the lead-up to that moment, the series has introduced us to many yet greater threats that make the problem of giant man-eating monsters at the gates seem downright quaint by comparison. This has always been a dark, morally messy show, but if its poster, which mirrors the first seasons, with Eren taking the colossal titan's place, bearing down on a new human protagonist and a new city, is any indication, then the final season promises to shatter any certainty we had as to who the real heroes are and what they're really fighting for, all while delivering some of the most thrilling human-on-titan and titan-on-titan -titan action to date. The armored and beast titans are still out there, after all, with three equally powerful titan-shifting allies to back them up, and considering how utterly bonkers the climactic battle of the last season was, I cannot wait to see our original protagonist and his pals squaring off against them. Between those massive humanoid foes and the big morally gray war on the linked horizon, Attack on Titan is finally approaching the heights of the mecha anime legends that so clearly inspired it, and I am super excited to see how it all shakes out. I really don't know if there's much more I can say to convince anyone who's not on board already. You've heard everything that's good about Attack on Titan plenty of times, so let's shift gears to another story about a bunch of kids fighting to escape the walls they were born behind and a future of near-certain consumption by monsters. The Promised Neverland. If you're not familiar with the series already, this is definitely one of the easiest of the big returning anime franchises to catch up on, with its first season clocking in at a scant 12 episodes. But man, what a ride those few episodes are. 
The Promised Neverland is about an orphan girl named Emma and her brother Norman who discover that Grace Fieldhouse, the quaint little vaguely Victorian homestead in which they've spent all their lives, is in fact just a hoity-toity free-range farm that caters to the upper crust of a world dominated by man-eating demons. Those things are big, they're mean, and they have eyes and teeth pretty much everywhere but where they're supposed to be, but even then, the scariest monster these kids have to contend with might well be their own mother, Isabella, who taught them everything they know while raising them to be food, knows exactly how they think, and has a lot riding on shipping them out. Emma and Norman are smart and athletic, but they're only 12 and they have a big family that Emma's too nice to leave behind, so they'll need all their wits and all the help they can get if they want to escape and live on. This new season's existence kind of spoils how that goes, but it is well worth experiencing all the twists and turns that lead up to the escape fresh. And if you've already seen and enjoyed the tense cat and mouse mind games of the show's first season, then you should get excited, because with season two, you're in for something completely different. Which is pretty obvious, if you think about it. It would be very difficult to recreate the deceptive dynamics between the kids and their mom in a new setting with a new villain, so the series has little choice but to run a new playbook. I won't tell you what's in that book exactly, but The Promised Neverland's manga is known for jumping to whole new genres with each new arc, and the first shift is, in my opinion, one of the coolest. If you thought Emma was a great protagonist before, you ain't seen nothing yet. And if you thought Isabella was an intimidating villain, you're absolutely right, and she's tough to top, but just wait until the demons come out to play. This is the first time anime viewers will get to see the outside world that created the Gracefield farm, and trust me when I say it is going to be worth the two-year wait. I can likely say the same for another show that we've been waiting for since winter 2019, the second season of the quintessential quintuplets, which is one of the most delightful and wholesome harem anime in recent memory. With a new studio and director taking over the series from Tezuka Productions, there is a chance that we'll see a drop in quality, but frankly the original anime wasn't all that impressive from a production standpoint to begin with. It's great characters, great writing, and a great premise that carried this series to its surprising success, and how Having read ahead in the manga, I can confirm that all of those things will only get better across the next few arcs. That premise I mentioned is pretty brilliant in its elegance. Futaro Uesugi, a straight-A student with some major money problems, is hired by some rich asshole to tutor his daughters, the Nakano quintuplets, who actually have perfect grades in every subject if you add all five of their report cards together. So Futaro has definitely got his work cut out for him, though obviously the academic angle is really just an excuse to get him acquainted with these five identically lovely ladies and their very different personalities. From youngest to oldest, by a matter of minutes, you've got your obligatory tsundere, Itsuki, the adorably genki all-purpose athlete Yotsuba, quiet, socially awkward Three Kingdoms history geek Miku, Nino, the motherly super tsundere, who is, at first, the coldest toward Futuro, and then, well, you know how tsundere's go, and last, but certainly not least, confident, capable Ichika, an aspiring actress who isn't shy about messing with our hero. We know through a How I Met Your Mother style flashback that Uesugi-san's going to marry one of these girls one day. However, what with them being identical and all, we have no idea which one it is. Lucky for him, they're all absolutely delightful, and lucky for us, they've all got great, hilarious chemistry with him and each other. With sweet romance, uproarious laughs, and a tinge of compelling mystery, you'd be hard-pressed to find a harem comedy that's more fun than this one. Though. Personally, I would recommend reading the manga over watching it, because uh, the art in it's just absolutely gorgeous. Now let's take a quick break for a word from today's sponsor, Manscaped.com. Manscaped is the only men's brand dedicated to below-the-waist grooming and hygiene, meaning you can expect the best product made with the best materials for the best possible grooming experience. No longer must we anime fans wish for supreme comfort in a pair of underwear if we want to enjoy a marathon couch sesh with zero distractions. With the tools and formulas in Manscaped's Perfect Package 3.0 kit, you can keep your own Dragon Balls as smooth and shiny as you like them. Okay, for a limited time, it does come with a bonus pair of anti-chafing 
chafing performance boxers that are, for what it's worth, supremely comfortable. And the other limited time free gift in the package, the Shed Travel Bag, has an understated stylish look to it that doesn't scream there's a ball trimmer in here. On that note, the package's main feature is their new Lawnmower 3.0 water resistant body trimmer. The only trimmer on the market made with advanced skin safe technology, which reduces nicks and cuts from common grooming accidents. With its powerful 7,000 RPM motor and rapid charging dock, the lawnmower allows you to groom quickly and efficiently, and its waterproof cordless design means you can trim in the shower, saving yourself further cleanup. The package also includes their Crop Reviver Ball Toner for your added comfort, and the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant for well, everyone else's. You can get those replenished and get replacements for your trimmer blades every three months when you sign up for Manscaped's Peak Hygiene Plan. And they have other hair and nail care products you can add to that plan as well if you're worried about more than just your balls. Go to manscaped.com today and get 20% off the perfect package, plus free international shipping and those bonus gifts I mentioned when you use the promo code BASEMENT at checkout. Your balls and body will thank you. All right, that's one ad and three out of shit, 13 anime down, and I'm just not gonna look at the timestamp. But in the interest of making up some of that, I think we're gonna have to smash a few of these together where it's thematically appropriate. And since we're, in a very vague sense, already talking about education, let's move on to the twin giants of shonen edutainment, Cells at Work and Dr. Stone. The former is... Basically, anime Osmosis Jones, focusing on a ditzy red blood cell delivery girl and her odd friendship with a white blood cell who often wears red, too, for, uh, different reasons. The latter is a bit more complicated to explain. Millennia after a mysterious light freezes the entire human population in stone, a young scientific prodigy named Senku is revived, and using the power of science, he sets out to uncover the secrets of his revival and the petrification incident so that he can bring back the rest of humanity and return civilization to a point where maybe he can go to space. Unfortunately, not all of the people he revives are on board for that plan, specifically Tsukasa, a guy who embraced the caveman lifestyle before the world reverted to the Stone Age, and who can crush rocks and beat up lions barehanded, thinks a lot of things about the old world kind of sucked, sees this as an opportunity for the young to start fresh, and is willing to kill to preserve that opportunity for them. The only hope Senku has of beating his Kingdom of Might's brawn is to use his own brain to create a Kingdom of Science and rapidly drag it up the tech tree, and through an abridged history of science and engineering, in record time. The first season was almost entirely about that preparation process, and also the scientific process, following Senku as he recruited an army, created their equipment, and laid the strategic groundwork for the inevitable conflict to come. The new season is called Stone Wars, so I probably don't have to tell you what it's about, though having read ahead in the manga, again, because like, all of my favorite things are coming back at once, I can tell you that this is where an already great story really starts to pop off, heightening the emotions, comedy, and educational value of the last season exponentially. Now, I haven't read ahead in Cells at Work, but knowing that the series is mostly about presenting different diseases and bodily functions in entertaining but scientifically accurate ways with an overarching plot of secondary importance, I'd wager that this new season will offer more of the same great comedy and action, coupled with a lot of fun facts. Not to mention more of the adorable platelets, who will be doing a lot of extra work on your body too if you try to elude them, because I will cut you. That said, what you should really be watching out for this winter is Cells at Work Black, a seinen spin-off series that's even closer in concept to the original Osmosis Jones movie in that its gender-flipped white and red blood cell protagonists are trapped in the decaying body of an overstressed alcoholic chain smoker, which creates plenty of openings for dark humor and plenty of opportunities to learn about medical issues that were a little too horrifying and depressing for its kid-friendly parent series. And yes, both Cells at Work anime are going to be airing concurrently, albeit produced by different studios. I warned you this was a hell season. But maybe you already know hell, in which case you're already well aware that ReZero Season 2 Part 2 is all but guaranteed to be one of this winter's darkest bright spots. I've already made a whole video explaining why I believe this series is a masterpiece, and several others exploring its themes and analyzing its scenes in greater depth, 
Actually, I've made videos extensively gushing about every anime I've discussed so far, and one I've yet to get to, but I bring them up here because ReZero is the one show this winter that I just can't do justice for potential new viewers in the time this video is going to give me. Any way you break down its basic premise, this series comes off at first blush like little more than a standard isekai power fantasy with a lot of extra edge. Sad shut-in otaku Subaru Natsuki thinks he's gotten a lucky break when he's transported to a Tolkien-esque fantasy land, only to discover that medieval times are even less survivable than our modern age for a guy with his particular social and practical skills, or lack thereof. Luckily, or tragically, depending on your outlook, Subaru can time travel, but only back to specific predetermined checkpoints and only by dying, most of the time in horribly painful ways. Thus, he spends most of his time in the series going from one ludicrously dangerous scenario to the next, returning by death over and over again in an effort to figure out what's killing him, his love interest Amelia, and most of their friends, with the threats and resulting deaths only escalating in severity as the story goes on. And they start by fighting a sadistic assassin lady who likes to literally eviscerate people. If that sounds like fun to you and you somehow weren't aware of it already, great, get to watching it. I cannot recommend this show enough. But even if it doesn't sound like your cup of tea, I would urge you to check ReZero out anyway. It puts its hero through the ringer for far more than just shock value. Subaru goes through one of the most compelling, emotionally raw character arcs in all of anime, earning his status as a hero like few others ever do. Through him, the series explores the otaku condition in a powerful, painful way that is about as far from escapist indulgence as you can possibly get. And unlike so, so many isekai, this is far more than just a one-man show. Every character matters, most of them are more capable than the protagonist. Every character has hidden depth and complexity, no matter how insignificant they may seem. Every time Yazzie and I rewatch this show, and we've rewatched it a lot, we pick up on a dozen new, subtle details, and that's without even getting into the lore, which there is an embarrassment of. Also, the animation is consistently awesome, and the music is pants-shittingly great. So far, Season 2 of ReZero has only amplified all of these wonderful qualities while still delivering the visceral dark fantasy action that makes that core premise so innately fun. The mid-season breakpoint was an emotional roller coaster, and with everything it's set up, the ride can only get wilder from here on out. Even with all of this stiff competition, this is easily my most anticipated winter anime. That said, it's not the only big-ticket light novel adaptation returning this season, and That Time I Got Reincarnated as a Slime is one of my favorite isekai series besides ReZero. Slime is a far more light-hearted, upbeat affair, and definitely more of a straight forward power fantasy, but it's still got a big, varied, interesting cast of characters and a strong emotional core that sets it apart from most of the genre. Not to mention a pretty phenomenal sense of humor. As is the case with a lot of light novel anime, the title kinda explains the plot for me. Satoru Mikami is an ordinary middle-aged Japanese salaryman who dies in a random stabbing only to find the freedom and excitement that that boring life left him craving in a Dragon Quest-inspired fantasy land where he's reincarnated as, well, you can probably guess. Initially, he doesn't have much going for him besides some elemental resistances and the ability to absorb the skills of things he eats, but when he befriends and absorbs an ancient all-powerful dragon who happens to be trapped in the same cave as him, well, you can probably guess that too. Like most isekai protagonists, the newly renamed Rimuru Tempest gets ridiculously overpowered ridiculously quickly, but the story actually pits those incredible skills, as well as the planning and development abilities that he acquired at his old job, to a suitable test. In pretty short order, Rimuru ends up becoming the leader of a village of goblins, who evolve into hobgoblins when he names them, and then he makes friends with some direwolves and a dwarf and some oni, 
and orcs, and before he knows it, he's gone from running a village to a city to a whole dang country. So now he's got to deal with all the political concerns and existential threats that come with that territory, along with the demon lord and harem-related problems typical of the genre. It's a lot of wild, varied fun that's only enhanced by the charmingly comedic, stylized animation and tight, funny dialogue. This show has one of the best and biggest ensemble casts out there. Under all the swords and sorcery, that time I got reincarnated as a slime is ultimately a story about forging connections on both a grand scale and a very small, personal one. It's about the joy of making friends, of finding people who really understand and appreciate you, who you want to protect and support, and the sorrow of losing them. More importantly, perhaps, it's about all the different things we can learn from all the different people we meet in our lives. It's a really positive, affirming kind of fantasy that I've been craving more of since it ended, and I am stoked to dive back into its world. Gosh, I thought I was supposed to be helping all of you narrow down your choices. Are there any of these returning shows I don't wholeheartedly recommend? Yes, actually, but I'm gonna talk about Beastars first. Although, considering who's licensing it, I don't actually have to for a while yet. For once, I should be grateful to Netflix Jail for lightening my load a little, and yet Beastars is so good that if you haven't caught up on the first season already, I have no choice but to tell you to go do that immediately, or at least make that a priority priority before that second season gets paroled. This is a difficult series to sum up in a simple high-concept elevator pitch. It's about a world of sentient anthropomorphic animals divided between carnivores and herbivores in a way that sort of maps to real-world social divisions, but also is kind of its own world-building thing. Kind of like Zootopia, but, you know, actually smart. Also horny. Like, ridiculously horny. Beastar's hero is Lagoshi, a big, strapping gray wolf lad with some serious self-confidence issues. He spends his days working quietly behind the scenes for the Cheriton Academy Drama Club until one night, out of the blue, his instinctual bloodlust awakens and he almost eats one of his classmates, a white dwarf rabbit girl named Haru. That's not the only change our pubescent boy is going through, though, and pretty soon all the wires for his instincts have gotten crossed and he finds himself going after Haru for entirely different reasons. Namely, to do that thing that rabbits are known for doing, which is an unfair stereotype, but also entirely applicable to Haru, who, as a foil to the timid virgin wolf, is rather bold and boisterous for a prey animal. She hates that the world treats her as weak and fragile, and thus seeks validation and control of her life through sex. Lots and lots of sex. Also, one of their classmates has been murdered and devoured in the dead of night, and Lagoshi has sworn to solve the mystery for the sake of his friend, but they are teenagers, so unsurprisingly, that takes a backseat to all the sex stuff. And honestly, it's kind of a good thing that it does, because Beastar's greatest strength, by far, is its characters. Clearly, Lagoshi and Haru are complex individuals with their own individual complexes to work through, and so are all of the kids who surround them, from the handsome some deer at the head of the drama club to the weird chicken girl who likes to sit next to Lagoshi and watch him eat the eggs that she puts in his egg salad sandwiches. Relationships at and around Cheriton Academy form a very messy web, and it is endlessly fascinating to watch all of these wild characters get tangled up in it. Beastars is a brilliant, psychologically rigorous coming-of-age story brimming with powerful emotions and interesting ideas, and it looks gorgeous to boot. Studio Orange are on the bleeding edge of 3D animation in anime, and from subtle fur effects to bold stylistic flourishes, this show takes advantage of the form like no other anime before it. As invested as I am in seeing what happens to these characters next, honestly what I'm most excited for is seeing what advancements they've made in the last year. Okay, now there's just... oh gosh, five anime left. That's like half a ones to watch list! I gotta speed this thing up. The latest season of Nanatsu no Taizai, or The Seven Deadly Sins, also appears to be going to Netflix jail, and frankly, I haven't kept up with it past the second season, so I'm glad to have that break, too. I did enjoy the first one, besides its anime original ending, that is. It's a solid shonen battle series with an interesting, unconventional fantasy setting, a strong sense of humor, and a pretty cool plot hook. Instead of up-and-coming nobodies, its heroes are a team of legendary knights, the 
seven deadly sins who've been framed for a crime they didn't commit and are now hunted by the nation they once fought to protect, which has fallen under the control of dark forces. I did really enjoy the characters in what I've seen of the anime so far. They've got big, bold personalities, as you'd expect, of legendary warriors embodying our seven mortal vices, and the show's power system and fights are pretty damn cool, especially if you like magic. I've heard the second season's even better, for what it's worth, but I've also heard that it's gone downhill, like, way way downhill after jumping from A1 Pictures to Studio Dean. And this new season does have the same writer and director team as the one that let most of the fans down, so while I can't pass judgment personally, I'd say there's likely no harm in waiting at least until the new season drops before making any effort to catch up. Unless high fantasy fighting is your bag, baby, and you don't care about the long-term narrative payoff, in which case the first season is a good time. That said, your fantasy battle fix might be better fulfilled by the other other big returning isekai light novel adaptation of Winter, Log Horizon, which tells the tale of a group of gamers trapped in the world of their favorite VR MMO. Though they're not just stuck playing it, they've been magically transported to its world with no way back and must build a new society together while trying to coexist with the already established societies of the game's now sentient NPCs. I've got a real soft spot in my heart for this series. When its first season came out, a year after the crushing disappointment that was SAO's Alfheim arc, I latched on to Log Horizon hard. Its cast of characters is much richer and more varied than SAO's, and while its hero, the villain in glasses Shiro, is still pretty OP, he's OP in a very specialized way, focusing on support and strategy, while more combat-capable allies do the heavy lifting in battle. On that note, its action scenes are also far more strategic and interesting, in my opinion, based on magic and combat systems that feel like something a real game designer would come up with, and its story features a fair deal of political intrigue and interesting world building. Much as I loved it, I fell off Log Horizon early in its second season, which also jumped ship to Studio Dean, funny enough, though it did keep its director and core creative team in the transition, so I think that was mainly an issue with the the particular story arcs they were working with, rather than a case of sudden onset adaptation sickness. As such, this is the show I'm probably going to spend the majority of my time catching up on before the new season starts, after I'm done torturing myself with the worst of this last year, that is. I can't say until I'm done with that if it'll be worth it for you to catch up on Log Horizon, but the first season at least is really solid, so if you enjoy series like Overlord, Bofuri, Infinite Dendrogram, or that other one, consider checking it out. Now, as for the last three big sequels of Winter, I've only watched a few episodes of their past seasons apiece, so I can't really speak to their quality or lack thereof directly. I know I really didn't like the first few episodes of World Trigger. I bounced off it harder than any shonen series I've seen besides maybe Black Clover, but I also know from my experience with Black Clover that it's not really fair or reasonable to judge this kind of super long-running narrative based on its early stumbles. And you don't get 73 episodes plus a second season based on nothing, so if you enjoy shonen battles with sci-fi themes and you've got the time for it, this is probably a pretty solid bet. As for the other two, I really, really did like what I've seen of both Yuru Camp and Non Non Biori. Both are incredibly cozy moe slice of life comedies, the former about a laid back group of high school girls who like to go camping together, the latter about four girls of widely varying ages, one first grader, one fifth, one seventh, and one eighth, who live in a town so small that they're all classmates anyway. Kinda like Higurashi without all the murder. I presume. Like I said, I found both of these shows to be immediately and immensely charming, and the only reason I haven't watched through them is that I decided to save them for a rainy day. Moe shows are a dime a dozen, but genuinely great ones are a bit of a rarity, so I like to keep a few in the tank for when I need an extra shot of dopamine, which I might well do before this year's out, knowing how it's gone so far. Though the stress of trying to watch them, all of these other series that I'm already invested in, and all of the new shows might do me 
more harm than good. There's three big new isekai coming down the pipe, an original skateboarding anime from Bones coming down the half pipe, JC staffs cooking up their own new figure skating anime, and as someone who likes tearing into bad anime, I can't very well ignore the potential of X-Arm. I mean, just look at this fucking thing. And on top of that, no, I should probably stop. I should have stopped a while ago. Thanks for sticking with me through this downward spiral, though. Let me know in the comments below what series, new and old, you're most looking forward to next year and why. And while I've got you here, I recently ran through my favorite anime openings of this year, a day before Attack on Titan Season 4 dropped. But there's still some great OPs in there, so please check it out. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.